Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on Cardinality Estimation. My name is Rasmus Pei. Today we'll start by looking at coordinated sampling, also known as KMV summary. And we're going to look at an application in distributed counting. Then we'll talk about the hyperlock lock sketch, that is also a cardinality estimation method, and look at an application in estimating graph neighborhoods. Finally, we will look at bloom filters and an application in estimating inter set intersection sizes. Last time we looked at random independent samples. These are good for many things, but not for everything. One issue is that it's unlikely when we do two independent samples that the same elements appear in both of them. Suppose, for example, that we sample from two overlapping sets, A and B. From A we sample a set SA, and from B we sample a set SB. Now, if the sampling probability is low enough, the, these independent random sampling, samples are unlikely to contain any, in, any elements from the intersection, or at least there will be very little information about A intersection B. The idea behind coordinated sampling is to make the decision of whether to sample an element or not uh, dependent or coordinated by basing it not on an independent random choice but on a random hash value h of x that is the same for every sample that you take. Such samples are also known as consistent samples. Let's denote them by S prime A and S prime B. A particular way of doing coordinated sampling is the K minimum value or KMV summary. To construct such a summary, we pick a random hash function H that maps to some large range of size R. So here, all that matters is that R is large enough. So we could pick it to be 2 to the 64 or some other large values such that we have very few collisions. The sample now consists of pairs of elements x and corresponding hash values h of x uh, that have small hash values. In particular we store the k smallest hash values where k is the space we have available. So let's illustrate this for A and B. So we order the elements according to the hash value. And let's suppose that we want to say, uh, produce a sample of size 5. Then we simply start with the lowest hash values and pick the five smallest uh, hash values from, um, from A and the corresponding elements. And similarly for, for B. So we are basically going to store all the elements and corresponding hash values below some threshold. This kind of coordination makes it more likely that we are going to catch or sample something from both A and B. Observe that the threshold can be different. So in particular, it might be that there's some element in the intersection that is included in one sample and not the other one. So in that sense, the sampling is not fully consistent. If we fix the size of each sample. So what are the properties of KMB? It's easy to see that you can efficiently update it, you can maintain a priority queue, and even do smarter things to get logarithmic or even constant time updates. Also, you can merge two KMB uh, summaries in, in linear time by eliminating duplicates and computing the median. Finally, and this is not obvious, we can take these sketches and estimate the set cardinalities. Okay. So the way this is done is that we look at the largest hash value among those stored. So remember we store the k smallest hash value and we store and we take the largest one among those. So this would be the kth smallest among all hash values. 
Now we can compute an estimator n hat, where n is the size of, of the set. Um, as k minus 1 times r, this range, divided by this hash value vk. That turns out to be a good estimator for the size of a, which we denote by m. So the intuition is, is the following. Let's look at all the possible hash values between 1 and r. Um, and we can think about the dis distribution of these hash values. Well, because the hash function is supposedly random, these are close to evenly distributed. And if we look at a particular interval, for example, the one between 1 and k minus 1 over n times r, we can uh, compute how many elements are expected. And for this particular element, uh, or this particular interval, the expected number of hash values is k minus 1. So this means that if we take the kth smallest hash value, it's likely to be just to the right of this interval. So that is, it's a good estimator for uh, the location of this interval. And now we can solve for n and get our estimate of n based on the observed value of vk. The formal argument uses Chebyshev's inequality twice to bound the probability that there are unusually few or unusually many small val values among the hash values. It can be shown that if we choose k to be O of 1 over epsilon squared, then we get a relative error of 1 plus minus epsilon with constant probability. Let's consider an application of this uh, summary. Suppose we have a bunch of sets, A1 through AM, and all of them are quite large. What we can do is construct a summary for each of the sets, and we can potentially collect them. Even if these sets are you know, distributed across many machines on the internet, we can compute these relatively small summaries of maybe a few thousand elements each. Let's call those SA1 through SAM. Since these summaries are mergeable, we can merge them to form a summary of the union of these sets. So here it's important to note that this summary depends only on the set of elements that exist in the union, not on the multiplicity. So if an element appears several times, we're simply going to eliminate any duplicates that we see. Now we have a summary of the union. We can use it to estimate the size of the union with small relative error. In terms of k, it's 1 plus minus O of 1 over square root of k. And this is going to work with constant probability. If we want something more certain, we can use repetition and take several estimates and take the median to get, get an estimate that is that we are quite certain is, is true. So if each estimate is accurate with probability three quarters and we take the median of roughly log one over delta estimates, then it's easy to show using Chaloff bounds that the probability that we get a bad estimate in the median is can be bounded by one minus delta. Finally, if we are interested only in certain elements in some sets Q, we can also estimate the intersection size of A and Q by looking at the elements in the merge sketch that belong to Q. The hyperlock log summary is a space-efficient alternative to the k-minimum value sketch. It doesn't keep a sample, and in particular we don't know what are the element, any of the elements in the set, but it does support insertion, merging, and cardinality estimation. The idea is to combine a lot of crude estimators of cardinality. And each of these estimators should use only a small number of bits. An observation we can make is that we can crudely order hash values by the number of leading zeros in the bit representation uh, of, the, of the hash values. 
So for example here h of x has three leading zeros and we'll denote, denote this number of leading zeros as set of the hash value h of x. Another hash value might look like this with a 1 in the first place, so set of h of y is 0. So just storing the set value rather than the hash itself is cheaper than storing the hash. So if the hash is order log n bits, for example, we can store the number of leading zeros in the logarithm of that, which is log log n plus a constant number of bits. In practice, log log n, for any reasonable value of n, is something like 6 to 8. Let's look at the details of how this works. We're going to use two hash functions. Let's call them h and g. Here h has a range of size k, which will determine the space usage, and g has a large range, let's say w bit uh, numbers, where 2 to the w is much larger than n. The sketch consists of a sequence or array of k counters, where the ith counter is a crude estimate or can be used to form a crude estimate for the set of those elements in A that hash to i under h. So, and specifically, ci is simply the maximum of the number of leading zeros of g of x of all elements x that are in ai, that hash to i under h. It's easy to see that we can update this under insertions, and also it's, we can see that if we want to merge two sketches, call them uh, c and c prime, we can do it by simply taking coordinate wise maximum of the values. And what we'll get out of this is exactly identical to a sketch in which all the elements that were ever inserted in either c or c prime were inserted. Now the question is, of course, how do you use this information to estimate the number of, of elements inserted, the number of distinct elements? And one thing we can observe is that if we look at the ith counter, actually the largest hash value in AI is going to be roughly 2 to the w minus ci, because we know that there's a bit in position uh, ci from the largest value. This means that we can estimate the size of AI using the reasoning from KMV as 2 to the power CI. We could extrapolate and estimate A as simply the sum of all this, these estimates. Unfortunately, this estimate is going to be very sensitive, sensitive to just a few large counters. It turns out, so this is a first attempt, it turns out that you can do much better combining these uh, counters in a different way. The idea is to take the harmonic mean instead of the arithmetic mean of these estimators 2 to the CI. And this is a much more outlier robust method. Um, and the details are relatively complicated, so I refer to the, to the book for those. One can show that the average relative error is going to be very small approximately 1 divided by square root of k. Hyperlock lock has lots of applications and it's used extensively for analyzing large data sets. One of the cutest applications I know is ANF for approximate neighborhood function. The setting is that we have a large undirected graph, vertex sets v and edge set e. We consider the case where the number of vertices and edges is really large, maybe 1 billion and 100 billion edges. This is still a pretty sparse graph in the sense that the number of edges is much, much smaller than the number of vertices squared. What we want to do is to compute for every vertex v the average distance, the average shortest distance to all other vertices in v. 
if you like, the distance distribution of, of every vertex. This only makes sense if it's a connected graph, so let's assume that. A baseline algorithm, what you could do after your first algorithms course, is to run breadth-first search from each vertex, so that's size of v times. But this is, for such a large graph, this is just unfeasible. Definitely on a single machine, and even with parallelism, it's challenging. An alternative is to look at sets. Let's define SIV as a set of vertices at distance at most i from vertex v. It's easy to see, or by definition almost, uh, uh, S0v is just v itself, and we can inductively define Si plus 1v as the union over all neighbors of v of Siw, for neighbor w, union with Siv. Now we can use this in combination with HLL. So if we know HLL for distance at most i, we can merge them to compute HSL, HLLs for sets of vertices of distance at most i plus 1, just using the above recurrence. And all of these merges, it's easy to see that they can be computed efficiently. We basically just need to do work ab across each edge so in, in basically number of edges merge operations, we can do this and each merge costs linear time in the side of the sketch. And we can repeat this to compute these estimates for different values of, of i. If the graph has small diameter, then it suffices to do this for a small number of iterations and we'll fi have found all the relevant information to compute the average distance. The last part, we're going to look at bloom filters. I'm going to describe a variant of what is in the book called split bloom filters that I think are slightly easier to understand. Bloom filters are an approximate version of a hash set, if you know that from Java, that stores a set of keys. You can insert elements just like in a hash set, and you can ask about membership. So a query for a set or for an element x. Let's, let's call the set of elements that have been inserted s. A query is supposed to answer yes or one if the element is in the set. A normal dictionary you would answer zero whenever the element is not in the set. But now things are slightly different with some probability um, epsilon we may not answer zero if x is not an s. Um, so pro with probability at most epsilon, it's acceptable to answer one or yes, even if x is not in a set. And with the remaining probability, at least one minus epsilon, we answer zero. So here epsilon is a parameter that determines how often these false positives, where we answer yes for something that is not in the set, occur. It turns out that it's, it, this can be done with space usage that is just O of n log 1 over epsilon bits. So for each element in the set, we pay just log 1 over epsilon bits, which is often much less than what is required to store the elements in the set itself. Split blue filters work as follows. So let's define the space usage as, or denote the space usage by n. We're going to use k hash functions for some parameter k, each of which map elements to one or to a range of size m divided by k. So one kth of the space usage, and we are going to have k uh, bit vectors that each use m over k bits. So the total space is m bits. So the bit vectors look something like this. The way we insert an element into uh, the split bloom filter is to is by evaluating all of the hash functions and using them to index the respective bit vectors. And we simply put a one in all of the, those positions where uh, x hashes to. 
So in the end, we are going to have a one in exactly those positions that some element hashes to. Some positions might have ones set several times, of course, but that's, that's fine. Yeah. So what about queries? So suppose we query for some element y. We're going to do almost the same thing. We're going to evaluate all of the hash values and we're going to look in, the, in these bit vectors. If we see a zero somewhere, then we know that for sure y cannot have been inserted because then we would have placed a one. In this case, it's safe to answer no or zero because we uh, can only do that if we know for sure that an element is not in the set. If it happens that all of the hash values that we look at, all the bit positions that we look at are one, then it might be that y was inserted. It could also be that we just had hash collisions with things that were inserted. And then we answer one or yes. So one parameter choice that works, it's not the best one, uh, but it's close to optimal, is to let k be the logarithm base two of one over epsilon, m, uh, 2kn, which is 2n log 1 over epsilon. So why does this work? Well, we need to analyze the false positive probability. So suppose that y was never inserted. What is the probability that we actually uh, have a value of 1 for every i in position hi of y in bit vector bi? By independence, this is just a product of these probabilities. And in each table, we know that there is at most n entries out of the two n entries that are one. So each of these probabilities is bounded by one half, and the product is bounded by epsilon. One thing to note here is that in order to set the parameter m, we need to know uh, n, or at least a bound on n in advance. One application of Bloom filters is estimating the intersection size of large sets. Or if you like, the number of common elements. Let's consider a very large set A and a smaller but still very large set B. So the question, so here it's, they are drawn without an intersection, but they do have some intersection. The question we can ask is how large is the intersection of A and B? And it may be that both sets actually don't fit in memory of your computer. But you can fit the smaller one uh, into memory if you create its bloom filter. Okay, so the bloom filter itself fits in memory. So now what we can do is scan over A, which is presumably stored on some kind of uh, storage device, and for each element in A, you look it up in the Bloom filter for, for B. And you get some number of positive answers. So now you know that the false positive rate is, is going to be S epsilon, so we can estimate the number of common elements as the number of positives minus the expected number of false positives.